Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of MoleCast. How's everyone doing? Awesome, awesome, it's great to see. It is a rainy, cool fall day here in Chicago. My energy levels are just, who they're, they're definitely lowered. Um, but it's good to see you guys. I always feel like every time I come to chat, I just get this like energy rush that just tells me to beat back the, the cool fall days that are coming up. Um, I'm super excited today about uh, this MoleCast. We have our first guest speaker. Keep your fingers crossed that Discord doesn't need us while we're talking. Um, but I think this is going to be really great. Um, and hopefully it gives you guys um, some ideas on, you know, possible careers. And depending on how this goes and if people are interested, maybe we could do a possible mini series on different careers. Not sure. Who knows? Um, as always, thank you to um, Ray and the Ray Chen Violin server for allowing us to host uh, this podcast here on the server. Um, if you're interested in science and other science-like topics, I invite you to join the science server. Um, if you're interested, please DM me. <laughs> Maybe not now, uh, so my DMs don't go off during this recording, but DM me later and I can send you the link. Um, and because this podcast is meant not only to share um, the love of science and classical music to other enthusiasts, um, we also, or I also on this podcast, like to highlight some of the amazing things that are going on in this server. And for some reason, everything is going on in like the next two weeks. So bear with me as we go through all the announcements of all the server activities. Here we go. All right, so first, on the aspect of classical music. So as you all know from the multiple pings that we've received this morning, Ray is having a masterclass um, at 7 p.m. to, yeah, yeah, I'm really bad at time zones. It is 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, and 7 p.m. Taiwanese time. Um, so this should be a lot of fun. You can definitely access it via um, the YouTube link that Ray gave in announcements. Um, but remember, master classes aren't just reserved for the best of the best. We also have master classes here on this server. So tonight we are going to have our master class with Eric and Beakless at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's going to be in one of the practice rooms. I am super excited. Um, we had our last masterclass um, with Q last week. I learned so much from that masterclass. Um, and I'm sure that Beakless is going to learn a lot um, from uh, and Kai. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Eric and Kai uh, from Eric. Uh, and I'm super excited. Um, and if you're wondering, hey, you know, having a master classes or attending a master class or giving a master class sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we have master classes coming up in the future. There are openings currently um, for, with violinists uh, Kay Prusnell and Jess, who is also speaking today. Um, and we also have other instrument instrumentalists as well. Um, so if you're interested in signing up with any of our masterclass instructors, please go to self promo and links and the signups are pinned under self promo and links. I highly encourage all of you to take advantage of it. Um, just speaking for myself, I'm an amateur. I am not a professional. I sound horrible, um, but Q was able to take um, the Fantasia that I was working on and really make it into something that just sounds beautiful. Um, so if you are someone like me who strongly doubts their abilities, um, we are a wholesome server. We're all super supportive. Uh, and I highly encourage you to sign up. Kay has gotten her videos uh, reviewed by Ray. Um, so it's personal. And Jess is obviously going into a career with music. So these people are good. I am smacking my hand to emphasize. Um, so definitely sign up and definitely take advantage of um, the amazing creativity and uh, resources that we have here on the server. Um, going, Moving on, um, if you are maybe not as musically inclined, but you're more of an artist, um, our community artist, aka Basement Gang, is hosting an art contest that is currently going on right now. So. Um, basically what the um, 
art contest is about is um, as I scroll all the way up to announcements. <laughs> Do not eat me. Here you go. Um, basically, they're going to hold a community art contest to participate. You need to create an artwork that contains your favorite composer or musician's quote. This is important. Don't forget the quote. It's so easy to forget the quote. But any kind of artwork's allowed. You can do calligraphy. There's um, collages, drawings, photography. There's been some amazing submissions so far. So I highly encourage if you're artistic, I'm not, I'm really good at drawing stick figures and circles. Um, anyone who has played me in Scriblio knows this to be true. Um, you should definitely do it. The art contest will close on Sunday, September 20th. So one week from tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have any questions, please contact Justina or any of the community artists and they'll be more than happy to help you um, navigate the, the rules and stuff. So definitely do it. Uh, next, another, so maybe you're not musically uh, inclined or maybe you're not artistically inclined, but you're a really good writer. We have something for you too, no worries. Um, so currently pinned in general, um, Irene and Blue Rider, two people that you might've seen around the server, um, have a, are currently working on a children's book. Um, called Pag Dragon, and they're looking currently for input. So if you're interested in helping with the book, please DM Irene with the word plot. Um, we have the plot ready. This I'm literally reading this DM from Irene, um, and they're currently working on the writing, and they're looking for people who are illustrators, people who can help with character story, story building, or anyone who just simply wants to help. Um, if this sounds like some sort of uh, something that, that is of interest to you, please contact Irene. I am so sorry, Irene, that I am pinging you. Um, please DM and, oh my God, I just did it in general. Ah, uh, boomer move number two. Wow, this is, <laughs> just keep track, Jess. I'm, I'm on a roll today, I'm on a roll. Boomer move number two, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, DM Irene if you're interested in working on the book. Um, as always, if you have any uh, events or uh, announcements that uh, that you want announced on Molecast, please DM me, or I also read general, um, and I can announce them here on the podcast. So, and with that, let's move on into um, today's topic, which um, is our guest speaker, Jess, um, and talking about music therapy. Um, so, this week uh, for Molecast data questions, I asked uh, the science server and on Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, the following questions. So uh, first, how often do you turn to music to relax after being stressed? And number two, what kinds of music do you listen to in order to relax? And Jess, I have to say, yesterday was a super stressful day for me. I felt like everything I touched, um, Oh no, oh no, <laughs> I just saw race ping, oh no. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, we're, gonna, we're going down really fast. Um, so maybe adjust your sensitivity or it might be me. Do I make my sensitivity higher or lower? Higher maybe? Um, Is probably lower. Coming from mine? Higher. I have, my volume is at like, 18. My echo cancellation is on. What is this? Do you hear my voice or Mo's voice? Mo, that's me then. Let's see. Uh, oh my, ha ha ha, I'm so loud. I'm coming through the speakers into the mic. So they're hearing me again. Oh, it's good now. Yeah, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. It's, uh, it's just a little tiny, little tiny feedback. Not to, sorry to interrupt your thing. All good, all good. We were kind of troubleshooting it earlier, and I said, you know, I need to level up in my uh, mic skills. So, <laughs> thanks, Ray. Nice, nice. No, yeah, you guys are you guys are doing awesome. And, uh, yeah, much love to you all. All right, bye. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> all right, so um, from the questions, pretty much everyone agreed that they listened to music in times when they were super stressed. 
Um, but the answers as to what kinds of music that they listened to were just varied broadly. We had people listening to classical music. We had people listening to Pink Floyd, um, rock, pop music. I think I someone on Instagram actually wrote down uh, WAP and I was like, yes, I see you. I see you. Um, yesterday when I was stressed, I listened to a lot of Hamilton. That was like the first that was the first thing I listened to. So much Hamilton. Um, what did you think about the data, Jess? I know I sent um, you some I, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, like a lot of people um, very often listen to classical music, especially on the server because it's, you know, mostly a classical music server. And people, you know, did say that you listen, uh, they, they listen to people practice a lot which I think is really interesting because, you know, sometimes like speaking on my, um, on my own experience, sometimes if I'm really actively listening to someone practice, like I get really sucked in to that aspect of everything. And then I like forget that I'm doing work. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way too. Like I'll listen to practice and sometimes I'll be super relaxed and other times I'll think like, oh my gosh, I've got to practice. I've got to get in those hours. (laughs) So it's definitely a crap shot. I feel like I feel guilty for not practicing, you know? (laughs) Yes, yes, me too. And it's like, it's not, it's not everyone. um, But sometimes and it's more for me when I listen to violinist practice because I play violin. So then I feel more like, oh man, I've got to get in those hours. I've got to hurt, like get motivated to pick up my instrument and practice. But like, if I listen to somebody play piano, I won't feel the same way. And it's just, it was really interesting. Um, But I enjoyed seeing the, the variety of answers um, from that mole, mole cast question. Yeah, for sure. So um, leaving, and I know um, music is a, an important part of obviously being a music therapist, but you know, when you came to me um, saying, hey, Mole, you know, I really want to talk about um, my career path as being a music therapist. The first question that came to my mind was, what is a music therapist? So can you just like go into that in in more depth for us, Jess, just for all of us that might not be as familiar with it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, to start off, I do want to make a disclaimer. I am still a student and I'm still working towards my accreditation. Um, So, you know, everything that I'm talking about now is not necessarily like what you should be basing everything you know about music therapy off of. Like if you are really interested in um, this career path, you should try to do some research on your own as well. Um, And of course, as a Canadian, I am speaking from a very North American point of view. Cool, cool, Um, yeah. I mean- I just wanted to make that disclaimer. that's awesome. How far along are you in your um, in your studies? I'm I'm I just started my fir- uh, final year of my undergraduate. Yay! Uh, congratulations. Pardon? Congratulations on starting your final year. <laughs> Almost done. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So you know about music therapy. Um, the Canadian Association defines music therapy as a discipline in which credentialed professionals um, with the title of MTA use music purposefully within therapeutic relationships to support development, health, and well-being. Music therapists use music safely and ethically to address human needs within cognitive, communicative, emotional, musical, physical, social, and spiritual domains. But that's just um, the Canadian definition. Uh, the American definition has a little bit more of a scientific or uh, research base and foundation to their definition, while the Canadian Association really focuses more on the, uh, I guess, the hands-on aspect of it. Oh, wow, that's Um, really interesting how two different countries, same, same feel, but have different bases on their definition. That's actually really fascinating. Uh, And then, you know, with 
um, with therapy in general, there are three essential elements that all have to be met in order for what you're doing to be um, considered really uh, music therapy. And that's, you need to have a therapist who has goals and intention of providing therapy, um, the client, as well as the music, obviously. Now, does the client have to come in with the mindset of, I want to be healed through music? Is that something that also needs to be taken in consideration? Or it's just a client? Doesn't matter. They're going to get help. Well, it, it depends, right? Like, in when we talk about the ethical side of music therapy, informed consent is something that's very necessary. And you want to be, well, like, clients need to be, very aware I suppose that they are receiving this therapy and so if if a client will come up to me in the future for example and says oh you know like I'm I'm not actually wanting this therapy like I was told to come up here right there's like mm-hmm. there's that's a little bit of gray area if they're like the, yeah by perhaps the state to receive this therapy that's you know something that we of course have to comply with but if it's just in general somebody who doesn't want therapy isn't going to benefit from therapy makes sense it makes sense so what kind what methods of therapy do therapists administer um so there are four kinds we do improvising performing or recreating composing and just listening and all of these are like just very generalized ways that therapy can be um, conducted, I suppose. Um, yeah. Wow, awesome. My favorite is. What's your favorite? Improvising, sometimes performing. Oh, cool. That that actually sounds like a lot of fun. So you. So actually, could you dive into that a little bit more? Like what's involved with performing or recreating therapy? Yeah, so um, performance or recreational um, therapy is a little bit of like you present um, something, a piece, and you know your, your audience takes away from that. And that's um, one of the models that, um, is not very popular, but people are un- have an understanding of it, and that's aesthetic music therapy, where the basis is basically like you perform something, and there's a huge understanding that um, the understanding is that your audience will take away something from it because if you put emotion into something, your audience is very likely to receive that emotion. Mm, and that's right. like a thing that happens whether the intention is to provide therapy or not. Oh, okay. Interesting. And you know, you mentioned a couple terms during um, your description of performing or recreating therapy that maybe we could go into just in a little bit, just so everyone's under understands the terminology that you're using. Um, so what's the difference between a model and an approach? Right. Um, So a model is a comprehensive system of practice, and this includes theoretical principles, goals, methodological procedures, um, specific techniques, expectations for the process of development, and most importantly, competency or training requirements. So, you know, you can't say that you're operating through a model if you were not trained to do so. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, and then an approach is um, it's under an overarching model and it's a way of applying a given perspective to a subject, object, or thought. Okay, interesting. Wow, yeah, it's important that for everyone to like, get in, in touch with the terms. And I'm actually glad that you went over that because when, in molecular biology, our models, our definition of models and approaches are very different um, than the definition of models and approaches in, in therapy. So thank you so much for getting us all up to speed with that. 
Yeah, that, I, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how, like, even though we're under the broad umbrella of science, even, like, within the science umbrella, terms can mean very different things in different fields. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes, you know, it does get confusing. Right, right. Um, so um, I know that um, as as we were talking, you sent me some references and you said, hey, Mo, you know, these are some really good references for you to read in order to get up to speed um, with understanding music therapy. And there's actually a lot of popular models and approaches that are mentioned in all those readings that you sent me. Um, do you mind going through some of these models and approaches that really help to guide and govern music therapy um, as to like yeah, their basis sure. and where you guys are going in the, in the future? Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the, I think in my, in my, um, in my opinion, one of like the most interesting ones is guided imagery and music. And so um, it's nicknamed the Bonnie method after the, um, after the lady who came up with this idea. And it's a very client centered approach for well adults. And the interesting thing about this um, model is that it actually mimics like an acid trip, you know, like the drug. Oh, acid, wow. Okay. Um, but using classical music. And that's, um, we have the therapist will come up with a set program. Sometimes there's like Bach on there. Sometimes there's Brahms on there. Um, and the program is set in a way that makes or that guides the so-called trip but oh. using music and not drugs and then afterwards you psychoanalyze the experience and talk about why you experienced the things you did and what that means for you oh wow that's really interesting <laughs> yeah, I never, when i first learned about that i was like Wow, so you, you can recreate a high based on just classical music. So does that mean, like, I can be high all the time? Is this the reason why I'm so addicted to Hamilton right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm very interested now in understanding if this is why I'm so addicted to Hamilton. <laughs> and you can't really say that this is a music therapy but you know maybe the science behind that is very similar you know if if someone wants to help me with an experiment where i just listen to hamilton for the next 24 hours i'm 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 down for being a test subject <laughs> I see someone in the chat is also in on this experiment. I, I see volunteers. Great, great. I, I'm very excited about this. <laughs> That's really interesting, Jess. Um, so um, thank you. And thank you for sharing that model. Um, so, you know, as we're listening to more of these fundamentals of music theory, and I know talking to people in general, in the science server, um, there is interest in people wanting to become music therapists. Um, so how would somebody go around um, becoming a music therapist? Oh, no, lag, no. Uh, rip. Ah, uh, lag. Great. Um, so, you know, as... Um people often think that when you pursue a music degree in university, your only options are like music performance or music education. And that's obviously not the case. Um, in Canada, there are quite a few options for an undergraduate music therapy degree, as well as quite a few options for master's degree. And there are way more options in the States. Feel free to ask me about more information on these if you're interested. Oh, great, um, awesome. Yeah, so to apply for a Bachelor's of Music Therapy, the typical process in Canada is that you first have to get into the regular music undergraduate program. So that's like, you gotta do your audition and you gotta do your interview and you gotta do your theory and all that, you know. Oh, you I'm still sure have to audition. 
Yeah, you do. Like, and at first you have to do your music degree first, ah, right? Like, ah, okay. Just so the university is very aware that you have to like that you can play your instruments, right? Yes, Kay, you still do have to audition. Um, and I'm assuming then you, as you audition, you're auditioning with other music performance, music education, like everyone's being aud- measured at the same standard. Well, yes and no. Um, you know, on your application, you write like what field you're interested in, right? So if you were to say that you were going to do, that you're interested in doing music therapy, they're not going to hold you quite to the standard as somebody who wants to do performance, for example. Ah, I see. Again, I I was telling this to somebody who's um, looking to do their audition this fall. Um, Professors who are conducting, I suppose is the word, your auditions, they're not looking for perfection. They're looking for teachability and potential, right? So they're not going to just hear you mess up, like, a few things. They're not going to be like, oh, this person is, like, not ready for a university degree. That's not what that is. I see. I see. So I do not have to come in with the skill the skill set of a, a, a prodigy or a soloist to pursue a career in... Okay. Awesome. Awesome. You just have to have the teachability and the potential. That's really interesting. And that's actually very eye opening. Make sure that they can build you to be the best version of you. And if you're already the best version of you, what are they going to teach you? True, true, true. I think that applies for any field, not just for for music therapy, but also in many science fields and a lot of majors in general in college, you know, being able to learn and being teachable is definitely a skill set that that everyone has to work on. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's, you know, first getting into the Bachelor of Music, just your general music degree. And you spend two years in the general BMUs before you specialize in BMT. And unfortunately, you do have to audition again you have to audition (laughs) again (laughs) yes and you might be asked to improv however whoa 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 jess we gotta we've got to rewind (laughs) i just feel like i got hit with a wall of information so let's let's break it down again you 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 audition initially to just get into the music school you go through two years of music education and then come your junior year you have to audition again, and you have to be able to improv. You don't have to be able to improv right off the bat, but they want to gauge your openness to learning about improv. So what else do you do, Superwoman? Do you save people on your side? <laughs> you're, I just, it sounds like you're, you're literally Superwoman. Like, you have to do all these music things before you, you even, like, earned your degree and you're still going like kudos to you i'm just gonna give you a small round of applause right there um (laughs) (laughs) like when when i first started my like when i was doing my audition i had no idea how to improv at all yeah that's not that's not something that's normally trained i mean i'm i'm now trying to find a new teacher here in chicago and i'm like yeah, so I know how to hold my bow and I know how to play things, um, but like I don't know if there's like an improv class. Like there, I I don't know of an actual improv class. There are improv classes in university that you can take. Oh. Like community music majors get to take class improv as a part of their undergraduate degree and community music therapy is such a thing that like people people from community music do end up you know becoming music therapists wow. and so they're like they're well set up to do improv 
I'm and just I'm reading enough. chat right now. It sounds like just from where it sounds like there's an improv, there's interest in having an improv class. Um, that would be great. That would be awesome. I I definitely support that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, wow. So okay. So we're currently in junior year. You have to re-audition yeah. again. You have to do some improv. What else do you have to do um, before okay. they give you the official music therapist degree? So I may have jumped the gun a little bit. First, you have to write a resume and um, a letter of intent. Okay, so you need to have writing skills. Oh, <laughs> let me just, let me just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but writing a resume and writing, um, that's, those are general skills, no matter what field you go into, um, any science exactly. field, many, many careers require you, not just in science, also classical music, also in languages, economics, what have you, resume writing is important. Um, so, okay, so you have to write a few documents. Um, yeah. and then, then what else? You asked, then you get asked to do an audition and the auditions, like it can be really simple for me. It was just a matter of playing like one unaccompanied Bach and then, oh, that's simple. Just one unaccompanied Bach. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> the amateur in me is going like, <laughs> I just read Gogo's comment. Simple. Sure. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm working my way towards to, towards unaccompanied Bach. It'll come someday. So, but that's all you need. All you need is just one unaccompanied Bach. You don't need to have like a concerto or something also prepared. Not necessarily. Like you can. It's it, it's really open. The entire process, that audition process, is really like just show that you can play your instrument, basically. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. And that you like actually learn something in your first two years of your undergrad. Okay, so apply what you've learned, essentially. It's yeah. not really then, an audition. It's more of an application. Mm -hmm. And then and then you do a little bit of improv. I personally was asked to do improv both on my main instrument, which is violin, and also, um, also the piano. Oh, okay. And I wasn't, I was not expecting to have to improv on both and so when I got asked I was like oh oh okay, wow I guess so like so there was really no warning it was just hey improv on your violin oh and by the way improv on your piano thanks yeah <laughs> really I, I was so stumped I was like I I don't have anything prepared you know um but it was fine I'm I'm in my last year of undergrad right like but um, then after that, after improv and all that, you will have to do an interview. Okay. Yes, you should learn the piano again, Kay. I saw that in the chat. Yes, you should. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, wow. I, now I just kind of want to get a piano, but I don't know how I could get a piano up six flight of stairs. Um, <laughs> um, so your interview, could you go, are you, if you can, I don't know if you can, um, but can you go into some of the um, like things that they asked you during during the interview? If not, obviously we respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I will try to remember what I was asked. This was like two years ago, um, but I was asked like what population I want to work with, why I want to become a music therapist. Um, you know general understanding kind of like a job interview right? okay but like a little bit more specific to your interests as a student ah okay so it's really tailored towards what kind of music therapist will you be once you leave our esteemed institution yeah they, they'll ask you like what clientele do you want to work with and what clientele do you not want to work with and why right so for me, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, my field of interest was and still is um, NICU music therapy. Oh, okay. And yeah, awesome. Like, 
Um, before we get into that, though, Jess, um, yes. do you mind just giving, because I'm sure that the classes that you have to take as a potential, uh, as a uh, bachelor's of music therapy are different than someone, let's say, in performance or in uh, music education. Could you just give us a couple examples of to the types of courses that you take? Yeah, so, um, you know, first, like I said, you have to do your general music thing. So that's like history theory all that good stuff ah um, theory someday i'll take I'll that <laughs> and then um once you get into your bmt you do things like guitar tech or um your psychology courses or uh clinical improv and like medical music therapy principles of therapy context and most importantly most universities will also um do practica and these are also known as sessions. It's basically like an opportunity for you as a student to go out into the field, um, not kind of like an internship, but not. It's not called an internship. So it just allows you to gain some real world experience as to what you're learning in the yeah. classroom and actually applying it to to act to actual patients to to help people. Yeah. Oh my and gosh, so, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then like. After, after all that, you know, after your undergraduate and or graduate degree, you will have to write um, an exam. In North America, you have to write the CBMT exam. And CBMT stands for the Certification Board of Music Therapists. Um, but a note here to make is that you have to do 1,000 hours of unpaid internship. What? Before. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, yes, 1,000 hours of an unpaid internship um, before you can write your exam. Wow. So on top of taking classes, on top of maintaining proficiency in your instrument um you also have to have these a thousand volunteer work shadow hours it's not volunteer. i mean i'm yeah i'm yeah. sorry <laughs> my brain is still processing a thousand hours and it's like stopped yeah, working <laughs> how long do you have to finish that jess how long um, you know however long you need personally i have eight months oh okay because it's a for my degree these 1,000 hours is a requirement for graduation. Ah, okay. So, um, you know, that's like, I'm, therefore I am moving home and I can't afford to live away from home mm -hmm. while I do my internship, but. Right, right, that makes sense. I, I definitely understand that. Um, and also, um, just so everyone in the chat is aware, all the links of all the exams that Jess is describing will be provided in the YouTube video, which will hopefully be up within the next couple of days. They'll also be posted um, in the science server as well. So you can access all those resources on both uh, in both locations. Um, so actually, Jess, um, after I've just re mentioned these links, you know, if I was a high schooler again. I'm 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 very committed now to my PhD. I'm almost done. I can taste victory. Uh, but if I was looking towards becoming a music therapist, um, and I was in high school, what steps should I be taking now to help myself um, become a music therapist in the future? Um, what steps to take? Yeah, you, um, something that I wish that I had thought about. Um, when I was in high school was to volunteer or shadow with a music therapist. And I, but the thing with shadowing is that you run into like confidentiality issues. So not everyone will be able to shadow. Um, but you can still like volunteer and work with your um, client population of choice. Right. And mm -hmm. then, I also would suggest like reading all available articles related to music therapy that interests you. Um, and you can find these on like Google Scholar or whatever. Um, 
Yeah, and we could also start to, we could also put together a channel in the science server um, to link to some interesting articles that you or other people who are involved in music therapy would also suggest. Um, so that way people who are interested in becoming music therapists can have a resource. Yeah. That would be good. I have like, I have a whole bunch of resources that I would be happy to share. Ah, yes. Looking forward to the data dump. I'm loving it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So maybe I'm not a freshman or a sophomore. Maybe I'm more of a junior and I'm getting ready. I'm taking my SATs. I'm taking my ACTs and I'm getting ready to apply for schools. Um, what would you suggest? Well, I definitely suggest, first of all, researching the method or approach that you want to take to music therapy. So that's kind of like that stuff that I was talking about earlier with um, the Bonnie method. There are obviously other ones like community music therapy, which I also talked about, or medical music therapy and um, Nordoff Robbins, all these like big words that I'm throwing at you that I would be very happy to share more information about um, at a later time. But if you are able to find the approach that speaks to you, try to apply to the school that you know um, has or operates under that model, right? So, um, for example, right now, I know that New York Steinhardt, NS, um, NYU, I think, yeah, NYU Steinhardt operates under a very Nordoff Robbins based. And I know that FSU is more medical. Ah, okay. So it's not every program has a different philosophy then. Um, yeah. It's not just like you can go anywhere and you're going to get a very similar education. <laughs> like the basis is very similar, right? Like, you know, you're going to get your psychology done and you're going to get your guitar skills and singing skills up and all that like very basic stuff you'll get, but the approach to education will be a little bit different and the approach to therapy that you then walk out of your education with will be a little bit different. I see. I see. So it really does help to do to do your background research into the program that you're interested in studying because it will help you out whenever you graduate because you'll be in the field that you're interested in. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Um, so um, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure that we get into um, your research interest because it is really, really fascinating. So do you mind discussing to us what you're currently researching um, as you're working on your degree in music therapy? Yeah. So um, like I mentioned before, my biggest interest in music therapy is NICU music therapy. And for those of you that don't know, NICU stands for Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. Um, and neonate is a preterm infant who is born prior to 37 weeks in the womb and or having the birth weight of 5.8 pounds or less. These infants face many extreme challenges in biological, neurodevelopmental, and social or emotional complications. And of course, their parents may also undergo significant stress, strain, separation, depression, despair, all that. And they're feeling like very not in control of their situation, understandably so, and all this makes them more susceptible to PTSD, acute stress disorder, and also postpartum depression. So um, last, last year, in my third year, I wrote a paper for a class that kind of looked at um, the considerations of the music that the music therapist should make when um, conducting music therapy in the NICU and so um, I think it's very important for the music therapist to consider the fact that our work affects more than just the infant right our as much as what we do have a direct impact on the neonates health and development I think that a music therapist must also acknowledge the family infant relationship that is undeniably a part of the therapy. Agreed, agreed, because that's definitely a stressful time for everyone involved, not only, you know, for for the infant and, and their parents, but also just 
um, the, the broader, the broader picture of the staff, nurses, doctors, my sister's a nurse, she's done some neonatal care. So I know it's very stressful. Um, but also, you know, extended families. So you guys really do have such a broad reach in the work that you do. And just kudos to you for choosing such a challenging um, field, not only, you know, with the, uh, everything that you have to know, but just the emotional strength that you need um, to deal with those challenging times. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, every therapist has their own therapist, right? Like, we're not meant to have to handle all of the emotional burden of being a therapist um, alone. We, right. we are given a space where we can release, otherwise, like, yeah, everybody would just kind of spiral. Yeah, I could imagine. I could definitely but imagine. Obviously, like, doing so while protecting your clients under our code of ethics. Yeah, right, right. Um, what, in your opinion, allows you to be the best music therapy, the best music therapist, boomer move number three, I'm running out of tea, um, <laughs> that allows you to be the best music therapist that you can possibly be? What skills or what traits do you have that make you believe, yes, I can be a very good music therapist? Um, I mean, I think that you need to be very um, open to what um, your clients are experiencing. So, you know, as a part of my research, I also um, talked about the following considerations that a music therapist should think about, um, not only in NICU music therapy, but also like in therapy in general. Um, and I, I'll have some links to the studies that I'll talk about if you guys are interested. But um, first, a NICU music therapy should really consider the family, like I said before. You know, um, many music therapists, such as Dr. Helen Schumark and Dr. Deanna hansen Abromite, these are two big names in um, NICU MT research. They advocate for practicing through a family-centered perspective. What this means is that um, you have to assume that the infant is inextricably bound to the culture, musical heritage, and context of the family both now and in the future. Um, and it also assumes that the infant is at the center of the family and that the family's role in the psychological well-being and progress of the infant is always present. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and then there was, um, there's also Henson and uh, colleagues that speaks on a family-centered care philosophy, which furthers um, the Schumark, Hansen, and Bromite family-centered perspective. And this philosophy helps encompass cultural aspects um, into care delivery for all healthcare providers in the NICU, including music therapists, by honoring cultural, ethic, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, looking at the time, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I know that you wanted to make sure that we had time for questions and answers from the chat. Is there anything else that you want to add um, regarding anything regard anything regarding music therapy? Yeah, I think I'll just quickly just finish up um, this this topic right here, this about like the considerations of a music therapist. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's really important in this, I guess in this time to really consider um, a client's personal baggage. And that's like, not to say like, oh, you know, your emotional baggage and things like that, but like possibly like oppression considerations and, um, you know, cultural considerations. Because, like, we're lucky to be in, especially in North America, to be in a society that is so culturally diverse. And there are so many things that we don't think about, perhaps, as, um, as people who have socioeconomic privilege 
or um, race privilege and all those things like we don't really think about oppression of minorities as much um but you know in the healthcare world now there's a lot more talk about anti-oppressive practice and i think that that's really really important in our society now especially in north america that we try as much as possible to practice with an anti-oppressive standpoint not that we may necessarily be dealing with those issues directly but just to have an understanding that personal troubles will be brought to the table and you have to as a music therapist as a healthcare practitioner understand what this means for your client and how that may impact your um therapeutic relationship yeah that's just that's so heartwarming to hear because as as a minority as a minority living in the U.S. And I believe it's not just in North America, not just in the United States, but all over the world. You know, it's really important that we, in, in listening to you talk about these anti-oppressive um, techniques, that we start to move towards a society of openness and a society of, of inclusion. So no, learning that, you know, other fields are also trying to work towards this, this ideal um, is so heartwarming, um, and it makes makes me feel that yeah, maybe 2020 hasn't been the best year, but we're working towards a better tomorrow. Um, and I'm just looking at all the heart blobs going on in chat, um, and I and I think the server also agrees um, that this is definitely just something positive to hear, especially in in these challenging and intense times. Um, and actually, kind of giving a nod to the chat, Jess. Um, how can musicians get involved um, while helping with helping to carry out music therapy? Um, you know, because we are all our community is a community that's always quick to rise to a call of help or you know answer or, or solve a problem or confront a challenge. How can we as musicians help to carry out music therapy um, and help others? Yeah. So um, at this time, you know, music therapy can only be conducted by accredited and certified music therapists or by therapy students under strict supervision by an accredited or certified music therapist um, because of how, you know, like music therapy is such a delicate profession. It is very vital that we as a collective people ensure that the profession's image is not tarnished by people who claim to be therapists but have no understanding of how to properly conduct music Uh. therapy. I can However, feel this. I feel this statement so much. It's like people who claim to be scientists and they're not scientists. And you're like, ah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so I feel you. I definitely feel you. Um, but what can we do? Yeah. So however, young people interested in music therapy may be advocates for the profession. Um, so you can read up on therapy and garner an understanding of your country's association, perhaps, and then when people do ask about music therapy, you are then able to provide a good description of what you know to be music therapy without providing incorrect information and or leaving out important notes, right? So, or, you know, if you think that somebody can benefit from music therapy, you can always refer them to music therapy um, and to help them find good therapists in your area. Great, awesome. I'm I'm sure that now that we have mentioned this in in our server, that I'm going to see a whole week or two weeks of you know people just really helping to give out correct information about music therapy and about music therapists. So thank you so much for giving us this amazing yeah. podcast today. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I can't really think of anything, but I'd love to open up the floor to some um questions yeah sure awesome um before we open up to questions because i know people usually jet in and out of here if you're interested in finding out more about um jess and jess's field in uh, music therapy uh feel free to uh 
chat with her here in the Discord. That's her username right there. I'm sorry, I just pinged you, Jess. Um, you can also find Jess in the practice rooms. She's usually either practicing violin, piano, or if you're late night NA gang, early morning Asia gang, you might see her do a guitar sing session, which are also really, really fun. Um, Jess is also someone on the server who is just such a relaxed, chill person to vibe to. Always great for, you know, spreading joy and just really wholesome vibes in the server. So we thank you so much for just being uh, just a great member of our community. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and open up the chat to some MoleCast questions. So if you're interested in asking Jess a question, um, just do hashtag MoleCast. So we're going to be able to see it in the chat. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So MoleCast question first, Jess. What inspired you to go into the field of music therapy? Wow. Um... I've, I've always had a love for music, right? Like I started playing violin when I was three. Um, and then when I got to high school, I discovered my love for psychology and I was like, I'm so torn. What am I gonna do, right? And then in grade 10, I did this class, careers in civics. Um, and I found out that music therapy was a thing. And then I was like, wow, after doing some research, I think that this really might be for me. And so I thought about it some more and I looked into the requirements and I thought, why not give it a try? And now here we are. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, so the, the another question from the chat, um, does music therapy work with prescriptions? And if so, what makes a person more or less predisposed to this type of therapy? Wow, that's something that I haven't really thought about or learned about um no problem no problem you know in in our in the molecular biology field we usually say i'm not really sure but i'll get back to you yeah. on it <laughs> yeah so i think like you just i don't think people can be predisposed to therapy i think that you just like something really important to think about is do you need to walk into every therapy session with the understanding that you are receiving help and that you do actually feel that you want this help because people who don't want help aren't going to reap the benefits of the help, right? So, so. true, so true. Yeah, that's that's not just a music therapy lesson. Yeah. That's a life lesson. If people don't want help, you just can't help them. You have to be open to it. Um, all right, another question. Um, what genres of music do you usually use in therapy? And is one of the genres Hamilton? That's my question. <laughs> Hamilton. I mean, literally, you can do anything. In sessions, I've done um, classical music. I've whipped out my violin and played, you know, the Hedwig theme from Harry Potter. Um, oh, yeah. My co therapist has brought in her trumpet just to improv. We've done um, just percussive stuff. We've you can literally do anything in therapy because our work is so varied. So like really depending on your client, you can do whatever suits your client, whether that be just singing Here Comes the Sun over and over again for like 30 minutes or you know, you play the entirety of the Debussy Suites, right? Like it's you can do honestly anything. It just depends on your client. Awesome. So a popular question that the chat is asking is how do you balance your time for practicing and studying? As for practicing and studying, I don't know. A lot of the time I just cry. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not sure, just cry. <laughs> everything like I will take a planner and I'll mark down every single hour what I have to do so if I have to force myself to wake up at nine every single day I'll do that and then I'll I'll just schedule in like three hours of practice a day and then but maybe I'll break them up and use like my practice time as a break from studying and my study time as a break from practicing oh okay things like 
like that. Okay, interesting, interesting, awesome. Um, we'll go ahead and ask two more questions. Um, the first question is, um, you mentioned that music therapy can be taught um, depending on which school that you go to. It can be taught really differently depending on where you go to school. Could there be potential challenges for a client who switches music therapists and their new music therapist uses a different method than the one that they're used to? Um, that's very possible uh, because especially, like I said, that there are so many different ways to approach music therapy. Um, but I think that in my experience, a client isn't very likely to switch music therapists unless code of ethics has been violated. Ah, okay. So, um, because if you switch, switch up your therapists often, like you said that there, there's going to be challenges. You're not going to be able to reap like the steadfast benefits of being in the same session and like structure and routine are very important for a lot of clients so when you go to one therapist you're very likely to stay until your sessions are up and I don't know if I mentioned this before but um your a, a therapist isn't necessarily going to treat the same person forever okay your, your sessions might like your treatment plan might be only X amount of sessions. It might be five or 10 of however many um, minutes, depending on the need. Okay, interesting. I see. Um, that's a really, I never really thought of someone just really committing to a therapist, but it doesn't, it doesn't last forever. Like there's, there's, no, it I see. I see. Great. Um, all right. So the last question, which is um, from someone that I know is interested in going into music therapy. I've had issues trying to balance school and music and choosing between the two. I've been told that, oh, you can only do medicine or, oh, you can only be a music performance major. You're so good at music. However, I've always been someone in both fields. I even major in science and music at my school's magnets. Did you ever experience any sort of stigma with being in one field only? And if so, did you have certain strategies to combat that sort of stigma? Um, let me just reread this really quick. Yeah, it, there's a lot. There's it's it's a good question, and there's a lot there. <laughs> so choosing between school and music, and between performance and medicine. I don't think that um, I've ever had to pick. Did you ever have experience any, um, did you ever experience any sort of stigma with being in one field only? Okay, so um, not to scare you, but when I first thought about music therapy, my dad was like, what the hell is this? And then in grade 12, I was like, I'm sticking to music therapy, therefore I do not need chemistry, and I do not need physics, and I do not need all these maths. And he was like, no. And I was like, yes. And then he didn't talk to me for the rest of the day. Um, but like, after the understanding of music therapy was really brought to light, that music therapy really is a science, right? Like based on everything that I've said so far in this podcast, like you can tell that there is science behind music therapy and there are jobs in this field, all right? Like I don't, my dad has now come around a lot more. Um, and I don't really think that you really need to choose between performance and medicine. There are like music therapy is such a great, halfway meeting point for so many things like for you maybe it's a great halfway meeting point between medicine and performance for me it was a great halfway meeting point between music and psychology so I don't know for me personally 
I never had to pick between one or the other. The balance for me, like I didn't take my violin playing seriously until I really like fully, fully committed in grade 12 to music therapy. Wow. Like once you found the path, the career path that you wanted to take, then the the music just sort of fell into place. Into place, yeah. That's but I know I know that that's not, you know, the case for a lot of people. And... No, no, no. I think that's it's such an eye-opening story because we all we all end up in music, playing music in different ways. We all don't take the same path. Um and it's just I I'm very fascinated by learning about other people's stories and how people discovered music, discovered their careers, and what paths, what life paths took them to being up here on this server (laughs) and where hopefully their paths are going to end up in the future. Um, And I think ending with you telling that story hopefully has inspired others who might be considering that same career path um, to, to check it out even further. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and we did it. We, we got through the, the first guest speaker with only one Discord yeet. So, you know, kudos to us. And thank you to Ray for holding on to the to the chat. That so, thank you know, you. wasn't complete chaos. <laughs> um, so, um, again, a round of applause for Jess for being our first guest speaker on the Molecast. Um, the next Molecast will be on Sunday, September 27th. Yes, we are back to the Sunday schedule because most master classes are on Saturdays um, and Sundays just work better for me, just not this weekend. Um, we'll be having um, our next mole cast will be on hear- the science of hearing and how we can better listen to music and listen to music more critically. So I'm really excited to um, convey the research that I have for you uh, here in the server. Um, as always, if you have questions about music therapy, um, please direct them to Jess. She's always on the server. Um, or you can just, you know, send, or you can, uh, ask questions in the science server. If you're interested in joining, please send me a DM or Justina, just drop the link in the chat. So you guys can go ahead and join. Um, and as always, if you guys have more suggestions on potential Molecast episodes, please, again, submit them in the science server, DM me, or just uh, mention them in general when I'm around. Um, always happy to find out different things that you guys here in the server want to listen to. Um, and with that, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys either tonight for Eric's masterclass. He'll be giving a piano masterclass in one of the practice rooms. And also for Ray's masterclass tomorrow at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yes, got that right. (laughs) And with that, (laughs) you know, there's so many times you got to keep track of now. Um, And with that, um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for supporting the Molecast. Chat soon. Bye, guys. Thank you.